just two weeks ago was New Year's, um, and that whole holiday season from Thanksgiving through New Year's is kind of this extended season of stuffing our faces with sweets and just too much food in general. Any amens to that? Amen. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that. So uh, a lot of people right now are having New Year's resolutions and goals for the semester that directly have to do with eating too much from Thanksgiving until now. Um, so we thought we'd have a little fun with words for our message series starting this semester, uh, especially just coming off the holiday season. So our new series is called Your Butt's Too Big. <laughs> Your Butt's Too Big. So. I want everybody to find a partner real quick. Just turn to someone nearby you. Figure out who's number one, who's number two in your pair. Um, and turn to that person. If you're number one, turn to, the, turn to your number two and ask them, is my butt too big? Now, number twos, number twos, we're in church, so you got to answer honestly. So, I want you to look them directly in the eye and say, yes, but so is mine. So, just for the record, we're talking about butt with one T. Butt with one T is what we're talking about. Because um, we're talking about, in this series, excuses that we tend to make that keep us from taking our next steps with God, keep us from becoming the person God wants us to be. So uh, as we work on our mission of collaborating on the journey toward God's best, uh, we want to help one another get rid of those big butts. So um, the topic we're going to start off this series with is uh, has to do with our past. So but my past it is the topic for tonight. Uh, it's the excuse that I cannot become a better person, a better version of myself. I, I cannot pursue God-sized dreams. I am stuck at this step of the journey because of something I keep looking at in my rearview mirror. Um, let's, let's give a few examples. Um, what well, has to do with growing in my social skills and, and my social maturity so I can learn to love people better. Uh, I could use the excuse, but my past, I'm, I'm in this mold and I, I can't change that. Uh, maybe there's a certain sin that stuck with me for years, and I've done the whole try harder thing and it doesn't work, so I might say, but, but my past, I just can't get around this obstacle. Maybe it has to do with adding a spiritual discipline to our lives so we can grow closer in knowing Jesus. Um, but, but my past, I've, I've never been able to implement lasting change. Um, or if it's going all in for Jesus and getting baptized, um, you might say, but my past, my family didn't do it that way. Or, or I grew up as an atheist, agnostic, or, or another religion altogether. What well, if I feel God calling me to Christian leadership, and I might say, but my past, I really screwed up over Christmas break, and he's not going to want me. You guys get the picture, right? These are the excuses that we tend to make because of something that happened in our past. Um, here's, here's a truth that I often share, and, and you may have heard this before, but it's, it's helpful for me. God cares much more about our present and future than about our past. God cares much more about our present and future than about our past. All of us have had bad things happen in our past. Um, stupid things that we did, uh, evil things that happened to us, tragic things that happened just because we live in a, a cursed, fallen world right now. Uh, but God can redeem our past and, and equip us to move, move past that obstacle, move forward. And, and why would he do that after what I've done? Um, because he loves us, because he wants to transform us into the people he designed us to be. And when, when we do that with him, he gets the glory. And, of course, there's lots of benefits for us in that process as well. Um, so tonight we're going to look at an example from someone in the Old Testament who had a pretty messed up past. His identity, um, even his name, was tied to this, this past. Uh, but God brought him through that in a life-changing way. We're going to look at the story 
Um, we're going to look at the life of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham. My sound just cut out. Yeah. Um, did you guys get me a new battery? Double A's. Okay. Touched it and it's better. Okay. Batteries are like this. So, um, Jacob was was the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. And uh, his story of identity being kind of put into a mold began at his birth. And, uh, Jacob was uh, second born of uh, fraternal twins. And when he came out of his mother's womb, he was literally grasping his brother's heel when he came out. We'll give a pause for that. Okay. Okay, um, so he was, see if you can find a couple of double A's so I can yeah, we'll be up hand. Um, thank you. So Jacob came out uh, grasping his brother's heel, his, his twin brother's heel, and so he was named by his parents Heel Catcher. What a lo loving parents to, to name their son Heel Catcher. In, in Hebrew, that was uh, Ya Akav. And somehow in, in English that's translated as Jacob. Um, and heel catcher was a Hebrew idiom uh, to mean supplanter or usurper. <laughs> so, um, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> We got a good team. Um, Jacob was named uh, heel catcher, uh, which meant supplanter or uh, usurper. In other words, his parents named him cheater. Came out of the womb with this expectation. And as Jacob grew up, uh, he okay, let's turn this one off. Um, as Jacob grew up, uh, he worked hard and living up to that name, uh, what, what people expected of him. So he cheated his blind father out of the best blessing. He cheated the wife that he loved by marrying her sister and taking both sisters' maidservants as his mistresses. Uh, he cheated his father-in-law out of many flocks uh, of sheep and goats. He cheated his brother out of his brother's entire inheritance and his father's blessing. So um, after living with his father-in-law in a faraway land for 20 years, God speaks to Jacob and tells him to return to his homeland. And uh, so this is what God told him to do. But in order to do that, he has to pass through the territory where his brother Esau lives. And he's kind of afraid to do that. He, he obeys God. They start on the journey. And while they're on the way, they hear word that Esau has amassed an army to meet Jacob. And so uh, Jacob prays that God would deliver him from his brother. And actually, that's the first record of Jacob praying for the past 20 years. He, he may have prayed during that time, but, but the Bible didn't record that. Um, and after he prayed, he devised a plan. He said, okay, I'm going to send my brother a big gift. We'll send that along first. Uh, then I'll kind of divide up the family, send the mistresses along next, and then Leah, uh, one of his wives, and then Rachel was the wife that he loved more. And then finally he would come along. And not that that's a good thing, but that's the messed up family that it was. Um, so he sends all his possessions, all his people across this stream. He kind of waits back, just maybe have a, a moment of reflection, maybe pray a little bit more, and uh, let's see how uh, God answers Jacob's prayer. So we're going to look at four phases that helped Jacob get past his past. Four phases that helped Jacob get past his past. Uh, and the first one is crisis. Crisis. We're, we're going to read Genesis 32, um, verses 24 and 25, and uh, you're welcome to follow along. I'm going to put them up on the screen. Uh, just because we're going to go a, a verse or two at a time. 
So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Kind of random. This, this, but this isn't just some random guy. It, it's not some attacker. It's not some thug that attacked him before he crossed the river. Um, later on, the passage reveals that this wrestler was a theophany. Uh, a theophany is a physical manifestation of God. Kind of like the Holy Spirit took the form of a dove to show up at Jesus' baptism. It was a physical manifestation of God as a man. It makes sense that it was Jesus in fully man form, kind of a preview of what that would be like. And so this uh, human form UFC Jesus realizes that Jacob's a pretty good wrestler, and so he summons up a little supernatural power and zaps Jacob's hip socket, and Jacob still doesn't let go. So why did God choose wrestling, a wrestling match to initiate chains in Jacob's Life. That's just that's just really weird to us. Um, when you think about it, if there's some obstacle in our past that's blocking our future, we're never going to deal with that until we come through some sort of crisis that forces us to wrestle with that issue. And so we kind of think of that symbolically to apply it towards our lives. Um, that the crisis could be some external crisis, it could be an internal conviction, but there's something that finally motivates us uh, to deal with the thing and to be able to move forward. So what have you been wrestling with? What have you been wrestling with? What is it in this season of life where God's allowing, maybe even creating, a crisis to get your attention? could be a weakness, a habit, a thought pattern, relationship, job, class, attitude. What would it be in your life? Um, we have to realize that crisis isn't always a bad thing, depending on what we do with it. Um, will it cause me to finally trust God and move forward? That, and that crisis, five or ten years from now, we might look back at that and think, Man, I never would have chosen that, but I'm so thankful that that happened to me because of what God did through it in my life. So the second phase in Jacob's experience, uh, number two is commitment. Commitment. Go look at verse 26. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It's kind of comical when you think about it and you're reading this. But remember, Jacob's not asking some random attacker to bless him. This was Jesus. This was God in the flesh. Um, and he was facing the crisis of uh, confronting his brother Esau, whom he cheated a number of times in his life. And he had prayed about it, and now he was literally wrestling with Jesus about this. And Jacob demonstrated commitment. Um, kind of kind of reword it, maybe in a way that we might put it. Um, God, my past is an obstacle to what you're calling me to do. I cannot get past it myself, so I need your blessing in order to move forward. God, I need your help. I'm not going to let go and fall back into my old ways. I'm going to stick with this until you help me get past my past. Uh, we had a, a leader meeting last night for his house, and, and one of the things I told our leaders was uh, to work as if it depends on us and pray like it all depends on God, because it does. Work as if it depends on us and pray as if it all depends on God, because, because it really does. Uh, having this attitude helps us be fully committed, fully invested uh, participants, um, while leaving the burden of it up to God, the results the burden of the results are up to God. When the burden's on God, that frees me up not to stress about it and have anxiety about it because, well, God's going to see it through. God's going to take care of the results. I'm just doing my part. And the, the idea of us doing our part and everything we can with our part, make sure we don't have a meh attitude towards this change and getting past our past. 
God's the one that empowers change, but he chooses to make things happen through our participation. He's the one that empowers change, but he chooses to make things happen through our participation. Um, so we, be, we need to be committed to not let go of God in the process. Um, if we see things start to turn our way, we can't be like, thanks God, I got this now. You know, we've we got to stay committed, um, keep him in the process, keep praying for him until he sees it through, or else it's not going to turn out nearly as good if we take a hike halfway through. Um, so work as if it depends on us. Pray like it all depends on God. Don't let go. Uh, our third phase for Jacob is confession. Number three is confession. This is where Jacob comes to grips with his past. At first, the, the crisis grabbed his attention. They turned to God for help. Um, and now God confronts Jacob with his part in his past. Um, yes, his parents named him heel catcher, but he lived up to that on his own. Uh, so Genesis 32, 27 says, And he, Jesus, said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. God knew who Jacob was. He, he didn't need to ask him. But, but maybe he wanted Jacob to come clean and admit out loud who he was. Um, that he was indeed cheated and usurper. So as he's on the ground wrestling with Jesus, literally, you can almost picture Jacob lowering his head for a moment and answering, my name's Cheater. Just kind of verbalizing that, come to the realization, yes, he had played a big part in that. Um, if we're going to be able to get past our past and, and chase God-sized dreams, at some point we need to get honest with ourselves about the part we played in the mold that we think we're in. Um, sometimes we know that we're fully responsible for that obstacle in our past. Uh, it might have to do with our, our personality type, um, but maybe instead of working on our weaknesses, trying to develop the strengths that are inherent to that personality type, we just kind of, eh, this is the way I am, and, and put ourselves in a mold. Or maybe something horrible happened to us that we had no control over. Um, maybe that big thing from your past really was not your fault at all. Um, but could it be? Uh, this is just a question, and um, I don't want to be insensitive or make light of anything. I've got some dark spots in my past as well. But could it be that since that time, uh, we allowed that situation to become an excuse in our lives? And that excuse itself became the big butt uh, of our past and keeps us from moving forward. Um, whatever part we played, if we knew we, we messed up or, or something happened to us and, and maybe we kind of built a mold around us and said, this is, this is it, it's not changing. Um, God wants us to stand up and take responsibility and, and get real with ourselves, get real with him, get real with others. Um, 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9, so if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And James 5, 16 tells us that there's healing when we confess to one another as well. Uh, that's part of collaborating. When we bring a trusted friend into the situation with us, they can pray with us. They can help keep us accountable. And, and accountability is not about rules. Accountability is not about trying harder. Accountability is about pointing your friend back toward pursuing Jesus, thinking about the relationship, um, not, not about the doing part. Um, so... Uh, it's not really wise if we decide to make post this confession publicly all over social media. It's just not really a good idea. Um, you wouldn't want to do that at a party. I mean, if you wanted to make any friends at that party, um, you know, you're not going to start publicly naming yourself by labels like Jacob's cheater. And you're not going to walk up to someone and say, "Hi, I'm Gossip. Tell me about yourself."
Um, so, confess to one another. Maybe, maybe that means to our ministry staff. Uh, maybe it means to a counselor. Maybe it means to a friend who brought you tonight. Um, but it's got to be someone that you trust. So, when we get the dark stuff out of the dark and into the light, that's when healing can, can begin. Um, it's not easy. It, it, it is definitely hard, but it's a necessary step in order to be able to move forward. So, uh, the last stage we see with Jacob is cooperation. Number four is cooperation. Genesis 32, uh, 28 and 29. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob's identity had been cheater, heel catcher, usurper since birth. Um, and over time, Jacob allowed, Jacob reinforced that identity uh, to himself and to everyone around him. Um, but God gave him a new identity. Uh, he was no longer a cheater, he was now Israel. And the context gives us a little idea of what that m might mean. Uh, struggled with God. You may have heard this that Israel, the name Israel means wrestler with God. Israel means wrestler with God, but it's more than that. It also means prince with God. Israel means prince with God. So Jacob went from being cheater, God gave him the new identity of being prince through, uh, through this wrestling process. And, and Jacob embraced, Israel embraced this new identity that God gave him. Christ, a crisis led him to uh, to realize that he needed, he needed to move past his past. And that he committed to God, to trust God, to see him through that change. He confessed the role that he played in letting that past be an obstacle in his growth. And he cooperated to trust God's work um, and take the steps he needed to take. So what was the immediate result of that little wrestling match? Well, Jesus, whichever part of the Trinity, blessed him. Um, and he goes and meets Esau, and Esau greets him with a hug instead of a, a sword. So, whew, pressure's off there. Um, but Israel didn't just settle for that. He, he didn't just get what he wanted and then fall back into his old ways. So there was an intermediate result. Jacob actually changed. Jacob actually changed. He didn't, um, he did move past his past. And, and from this point on in Scripture, he's no longer cheater. Like, the things that he does don't describe him as a cheater anymore. We actually see him become generous. We actually see him become someone who blesses others instead of being a usurper. And then the long-term result is this prince had a kingdom legacy. Um, one of his sons became the second ruler in Egypt right under Pharaoh. Uh, all of his descendants became the kingdom of Israel. And many generations after that, his wrestling buddy, uh, UFC Jesus, re-entered creation uh, as a descendant of Israel, as the Prince of Peace. So, the message of Jacob is this, you don't have to say, stay the same. You don't have to stay the same. Um, and let me close with an illustration. The rails on a standard U.S. railroad um, are four foot, eight and a half inches apart. And everywhere, all locations, all the rails, four foot, eight and a half inches apart. Um, why is that? Well, the people who would design the railroad system in America came from Britain. And that's the way they had them in Britain. They were four foot, eight and a half inches apart for the rails in Britain. Well, why did they have them that distance apart in Britain? Well, they made the rails that distance apart because that's how far apart the rails for the tramways were in Britain. The tramways preceded the, the locomotive there, and so they made them four foot, four, eight and a half inches wide. Well, why were the, the tramways, why were the tram rails that width? 
So you go back further, well, that's the width of the wagon wheels. They were four foot, eight and a half inches wide. So, okay, why, why would they make wagon wheel, wheels precisely that width? Well, it was because the ruts in all the rural highways that preceded those wagons were four foot, eight and a half inches wide. And, okay, so why were the ruts in these roads that width? Well, because the Romans built all the roads in Europe and they made them all four foot, eight and a half inches wide. Well, well why, that, why were the ruts all that width? Because the wheels on the chariots, the war chariots, were four foot, eight and a half in, inches wide. So you might ask, why did the chariot wheels need to be four foot, eight and a half inches wide? Because that's the width that would accommodate two rear ends of war horses. And that's why our railroads are the width that they are today. So um, you, you might say to the that the pioneers who kind of in, built those railroads could say, you know, but my past, based on that. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm a little bit. Um, it's probable that the people who built the, the wagons and the trams and the railroads in centuries since the Roman Empire had no idea why it was that specific width. Uh, but we know that. Um, we now know that just because that's the way it's always been done doesn't mean that's the way it has to be. Just because that's the way it's always been done doesn't mean that's the way it has to be. So what in your life has God been nudging you about? You thought, that's just the way things are. Uh, that's my mold. I, I can never change that. God would tell us, no, we can change that. But by my power, through crisis to get your attention, through uh, your commitment, through confession about you know, our part in that, through cooperation, God tells us that we can break out of that mold and move past our past. Now let me pray.